welcome to Montgomery County's Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Speaker Series. In honor of Women's History Month, today's program is entitled Leading with Courage, Breaking Through Barriers and Persevering Through the Challenges, and Persevering Through the Challenges. This will be delivered to us by our esteemed guest speaker, Kristen Gibbons Fedden Esquire. Before we hear from quick Kristen, I just have a few notes. There will be time at the end of this session for a few questions. So please enter your questions and your comments in the chat. Our co-host, Teresa Harris, Montgomery County's public affairs manager will moderate the chat and close our program for today. Also note that this session is being recorded. Now, without further delay, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Barbara O'Malley, Montgomery County's Deputy Chief Operating Officer, to introduce our speaker today. Again, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful time. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome for, to joining us today. Um, Kristen, let's give you a background on her, is widely regarded as one of the nation's leading litigators in the field of sexual abuse and civil rights. She is nationally acclaimed as a fierce litigator, and Kristen has represented numerous sexual abuse survivors in their pursuit of civil justice and received a multitude of awards for her tireless work with the most vulnerable survivors. Kristen began her work with victims as a prosecutor in Montgomery County, where she served as captain of the domestic violence and elder abuse units and a member of the sex crimes unit. In that role, she successfully litigated scores of cases to verdict, including trials involving sexual and physical abuse, domestic violence, and homicide. While a prosecutor, Kristen received multiple commendations for her courtroom successes and efforts on behalf of survivors. By taking many cases to trials that other would not, Kristen demonstrated her dedication to survivors time and time again. While her now famous closing argument in the second trial of Commonwealth v. William H. Cosby put her in the international spotlight, Kristen has always been dedicated to fighting for victims of sexual abuse both in and out of the courtroom. Outside of the courtroom, Kristen provides a powerful voice for victims nationwide. She uses her experience and training in law enforcement to passionately fight for people and groups who have suffered unfair discrimination by police or government. She's regularly called upon for expert commentary on high profile matters by attorneys and international and national media outlets. She has traveled internationally, speaking out and fighting for changes in the law and in our society's understanding of the dynamics of sexual violence and the effects of sexual trauma on survivors. She has been recognized by numerous victims' rights organizations around the country for this work. She is a proud member of various boards and commissions and the vice president of the Montgomery County's Victim Services Center and a member of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court Criminal Procedural Rules Committee. Kristen is also an adjunct professor at the Temple University Beasley School of Law and occasionally teaches in the top-ranked Temple LLM program in trial advocacy. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. And thank you, Montgomery County, um, for having me. It is so wonderful to speak to all of you my fellow Montgomery County friends. And as Barbara pointed out, you know, I have all of my roots here in Montgomery County. I am a former judicial law clerk for the Honorable Garrett D. Page. I am a former prosecutor in the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office. And I wanna show you what they gave me when I, when I left. I am now actually the president of the board for Victim Services Center uh, right here in Montgomery County. Uh, I am a present member of the Montgomery County Bar Association. And most importantly, I am a proud resident raising her angels. This is my Ethan. And this is my Nikki. In this beautiful, beautiful county, I am beyond honored to be here. And I am so humbled to be asked to be the keynote speaker and kick off Women's History Month with all of you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for lending me your ear for this hour. During Women's History Month, we, we celebrate the countless women who have fought tirelessly and courageously for equality, for justice, and opportunity in our nation. 
We celebrate the contributions of some of the most influential women in American history, including those who may not have always been in the spotlight. Those women, through their courage, their determination, and their unwavering commitment to justice and equality have left a lasting impact on our country. And they continue to inspire future generations. During this month, we come together to recognize the contribution of women. Women like Harriet Tubman, a former slave and abolitionist, Sojourner Truth, an abolitionist and women's rights activist, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, women's rights activists and suffragists who were leaders in the fight for women's suffrage and worked tirelessly to secure the right to vote for women. Ida B. Wells, a black journalist, suffragette, civil rights activist, and a pioneering voice in the fight against lynching and segregation. We join together to celebrate these great historical women from many generations past, but we yet we cannot overlook our generation's pioneers who stand amongst us as the living legacies of our historical sisters. Women such as Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, who made history as the first black female Supreme Court justice and Kamala Harris, our nation's first female vice president of the United States. And even here in our Commonwealth and in our county, History is being made and barriers, barriers are being broken. I wanna recognize Commissioner Jamila Winder, the first black female Montgomery County Commissioner. And you know, the Honorable Anita Brody, currently a sitting federal judge in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, she was the first female on the Common Pleas Court of Montgomery County. The Honorable Cheryl Austin, who was the first black female on the common pleas bench here in Montgomery County. The Honorable Carolyn Tornetta Carluccio, the first woman to lead the Montgomery County bench as the president judge. The Honorable Deborah Todd, who is the first female head or chief of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. The Honorable Risa Betri Furman, who made history as the first female elected district attorney in this county. Here, Bradford Gray, who made history as the first black female chief public defender in this county. Representative Joanna McClinton, who was recently elected the first speaker of the Pennsylvania House. Let's pause and just meditate for a moment on the significance of all of the firsts, the firsts occurring within our lifetime and all the firsts yet to come and occur in our children's lifetimes. These women serve as an inspiration to us all and their legacy will continue to inspire future generations. And so why is that important? Well, because it is in this context with that backdrop that I challenge those who even still today ask whether or not a woman has achieved such a position just because she was a woman. And that is at the heart of what I wanna to discuss today. While I am blessed enough to have my hard work and sacrifice pay off, and I will never, ever, ever forget all of those people, male and female, many of whom may even be on this Zoom call, who helped and continue to help me. I very frequently have my accomplishments, my promotions, and my achievements minimized by rumors, questions, and comments, such as, did she get that position because she was a woman? Or, was she assigned that case because she was a black woman? Or even worse yet, you know, the only reason you got that is because you're a woman or because you're a black woman. 
When you are the first woman or the first woman of color to hold a position of power after hundreds of years of men, specifically white men, holding that position unquestioned, you did not get that position because you're a woman. You went against all historical odds and rose to power despite being a woman. And that is what I wanna to discuss today. That's the issue that I wanna tackle from the standpoint of credibility. And what do I mean by credibility? That's the threshold question here. And look, I may be a lawyer, but I'm not attempting to teach you some objective definition of what I mean by credibility. Instead, I'm attempting to reach a working one. The definition of credibility that is actually defined as the universe of judgments and decisions made at the highest levels of professional leadership that while perhaps nominally merit-based are in reality often incredibly subjective and open to a slew of unconscious and conscious biases that disproportionately affect women and people of color. We see these biases bubble up to the surface daily, but often remain oblivious to the depths of the problems below. Let me start with an example from my own life. When I was assigned to the case of Commonwealth v. Cosby, I had already demonstrated certain skills and displayed an aptitude for trial work. In law school, I was part of the esteemed trial university trial team. They're number one in the nation right now. And I was under the tutelage of the late great Eddie Obama. And I, and I brought this book because I never go to any courthouse, never go to any courtroom without this book. He literally wrote the book of evidence. I was fortunate to be under his tutelage. He required of us not simply a mastery of the skills of evidence, but the ability to use those skills tactfully for successful advocacy. He was demanding and could be intimidating, but his results were indisputable. And my skills in the courtroom were tempered early by his fire. Moreover, as a prosecutor, I was widely known not to back down from a difficult trial. And I was not driven or led by fear of losing a case that I knew had problems, but yet that I knew I could prove. I was successful in the courtroom and I had respect from the bench and the defense bar that spoke to my aptitude, my fair judgment and my skill. I say this not to toot my own horn. Any friends who are in the audience know I have imposter syndrome and I'm not afraid to admit it. So anyone who knows me is, knows that I'm not saying this to toot my own horn, but rather it's important to highlight this because despite all of that, during and even after both trials against William Cosby, even after I successfully delivered a closing argument that was highlighted in the New York and the London Times, even now I am asked, not once was I asked this, not twice, but on countless occasions. Do you think you were put on the Cosby case because you're a female? Or do you think you were put on that case because you're black? The easy answer is to list all of my accomplishments and quickly retort now. The not so easy answer and the honest answer is I had no idea why I was assigned that case. I didn't make the assignments. And for years, when that question was asked of me, I held my pain inside. When I was questioned in that regard, I shrugged. I didn't know how to respond. And then one day, it was like a flashlight. It hit me. I shouldn't be ashamed of that question. 
I shouldn't be the one who's in pain. No. Because the question regarding the reason why I was put on the case is of significantly lesser importance than the real question, which is what really was being asked of me. Why? Why is that question being asked? The real question is why or for what purpose was I being used? The reason where I got to this journey is because I began to ask myself, would such a question have been asked of my white male co-counsel? And I can give you that answer. The answer is no. That question was not asked of my white male co-counsel. And how do I know? Because I checked with him when I was asked to write this speech and I again checked with him this morning. Nobody, not one person asked attorney Stu Ryan if he was on the case because he was white or because he was male or because he was straight. Not one person asked my white male co-counsel why he was assigned to the Cosby case. These questions were irrelevant and they seem absurd to even discuss. There was no deeper investigation into the motives behind his assignment. It was presumed that he was a competent attorney and the best choice for the position. But candidly, neither District Attorney Kevin Steele, Attorney Ryan, nor I had ever been faced with a case of this magnitude with international scrutiny against a defendant with worldwide fame and nearly limitless resources. There wasn't any objective proof that any one of us were up for the task. But any question as to DA Steele or Attorney Ryan's qualifications, well, they were presumed. Only I had to answer an additional question. Only I had to face a perhaps rebuttable presumption of incompetence. And therein lies the crux of credibility. It's not in the questions, but rather the impulses underneath the surface that lead to those questions being asked or even considered. Did she get that job, that case, that partnership because she's a woman, because she's black? Because, and this is a question that is asked of women because or talked about behind people's backs because she slept with the right people or because leadership found her attractive. Those thoughts exist in more minds than lips ever speak them. Ladies, our credibility is questioned more often than we know. But why? Why is credibility so important? Well, because credibility fills in so many of the gaps that exist in our supposedly meritorious systems of advancement. And it's therefore a prerequisite for opportunity. For most decisions, no matter how thorough we believe our metrics are or flawless our systems, subjective judgment still remains the crucial deciding factor. Advancement is not simply a reward for superior performance. It is also an opportunity to fill a role that requires more than the previous role. That means that there is a gap between what one has shown they can do and what one is now expected to be able to do. But in order to receive the opportunity to show that one can fulfill that new role, the decision maker first has to be able to imagine or visualize that person in the new role. Therefore, the question 
of who the decision maker is matters immensely. Because upon whose subjective judgment does my advancement depend? And what informs their visions for me? What informs their perceptions of me? If you can't see me now, how can you possibly see where I'm going? How can you possibly see my potential? Consistently, I am asked what I do. After I tell people I'm a, I'm a lawyer, I'm consistently told, you don't look like a lawyer. I'm young, I'm in my mid twenties, I'm black, I'm female. All right, those in the audience are probably giggling to themselves because I'm not in my mid twenties anymore, but I can be what I want, so I will. But look, on a more serious note, if I don't look like a lawyer, how could I possibly look like a partner in a law firm? What is our societal image of a partner, of a CEO, of a chair of a board? Ursula Burns, the first black woman to ever helm a Fortune 500 company once said, the world would be a better place if half the companies and half the countries were run by women and half the homes were run by men. And I'm sorry to report, but as of the end of 2022, the world is not yet a better place as Ms. Burns would view it. The current state of female leadership in the United States of Fortune 500 boards and in the C-suite is dismal and disappointing. Despite making up more than half of the population and nearly half of the workplace or workforce, Women are severely underrepresented and underpaid at the top levels of corporate America. According to a report by Catalyst, a nonprofit organization that advocates for women in business, as of 2022, women hold only 8.8% .8 of leadership positions at Fortune 500 companies. This includes 41 CEOs, 29 chairpersons, and 146 executive officers. Moreover, less than 1% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women of color, and only four are Black women. And if you thought those stats could not be more alarming, you'd be even more shocked to know that these numbers have barely changed over the past decade. This evidences the ever persistent glass ceiling that prevents women from advancing to the highest ranks of corporate power. We see the trends in the legal industry. Women make up more than half of all Juris Doctorate students in ABA approved law schools, but they still are underrepresented in top ranked law schools and face a sharp gender divide in terms of career prospects. On average, only about 23% of equity partners among the AMLAW 200 are women. And women lawyers of color face even more challenges and discrimination than their white counterparts as they often have less access to high quality assignments, fair opportunities for promotion, mentoring and sponsorship, and recognition for their work. Only 3% of women lawyers of color become equity partners. So I ask again, what is our societal image of a CEO or of a law partner? And I'll even ask it again. Do I look like a lawyer? To anyone who graduated law school in the past decade or two, I would say that when they looked around and they saw their peers, they made up about half, females to males. And as women in law school, we made deep and bonding relationship with our peers that then blossomed into professional relationships. We became of professional age with others who looked like us. 
others who sounded like us, and those who shared certain unique feminine experiences. But that's not the case when you go back in time 30 to 40 years. The average age of a partner in a law firm today is in the mid 50s or 60s. And when they graduated law school, only around 3% of partners were women. And how many of those 3% do you think were women of color? I don't have the number, but would it even surprise you if it was zero? The point is the same. Do you think I look like the archetypical law firm partner to them? But despite what the legal landscape looked like when the current leadership generation was coming of professional age, time has marched on. While women used to make up less than 10% of law school enrollment until the 1970s, by the 1980s, women made up around 40 to 40% of the enrolled Juris Doctorate population. Female enrollment continued to marginally increase in the 90s and nearly hit 50% in the early 2000s before taking a little bit of a dip. But by 2016, women became the majority of students enrolled in accredited law schools in the US. And I'm not trying to just give you legal quotes because I'm a lawyer, but there's an important point here. By 2016, women became the majority. So we're talking about nearly 40 years of women making up more than 40% of students obtaining their law degree. So certainly by this point, by today, a female lawyer should be no aberration, even for the old guard. And we do see this somewhat reflected at the associate attorney level. At the leadership level, however, it's another story altogether, and it reflects the lack of female opportunity for advancement. The organic numbers we should expect to see at the leadership level should be some proportional reflection of the enrollment numbers that were seen 15 to 20 years prior, yet that's not the case at all. It's not even close. And I would go ahead and say that that's reflective on many industries, not just the legal field. And what am I referring to when I say leadership? I'm talking about partnership, especially equity partners, managing partner positions, shareholder, principal, firm governance and compensation committees, and similar roles of control and compensation in the firm. Here there is a clear pattern of failure on the part of law. And like I said, because I think this extends ag across all industries, other industries across this country. With men and women making up approximately the same number of legal associates and legal associate hires, it is inexplicable and inexcusable that women should account for 20% fewer non-equity partners than men and 30% fewer equity partners than men. Does that sound proportional? Does it sound like an organic or meritorious process that resulted in 80% of equity partners being male? 70% of non-equity partners being male? Women are the majority enrolled in law school. Law is a female dominated profession at this point. And that is not an aspirational statement. Yet in law, women only represent 25% of those compensation and control committees in the firm. 75% of these committee positions are held by men. So let's be frank, it's painless to give up something that doesn't cost you anything. Leadership doesn't suffer by paying a woman for the tasks that a man had formerly done. The same is true of support staff. In fact, at all levels, women are 
unfortunately viewed as a cost savings. And they're compensated across the board 90 to 94% of their male counterparts compensation. The real test is that of giving up control, giving up equity, giving up management, and significantly, giving it up to someone who doesn't look like you, someone who doesn't sound like you, someone who doesn't spend their free time in the same spaces as you, and someone who doesn't look like those who have historically held those positions. That's a real struggle. That's pain. So I'll ask you again, do I look like a lawyer? Maybe, some of you may say maybe, but here's the better question. Do I look like an equity partner? And the answer is no, because only 3% of equity partners look like me, only 3%. So I go back to that original question. Upon whose judgment does my advancement depend? Nobody who looks like me, it's mostly men. And despite an incredibly growing diversity of attorneys, the top still represents racial and gender uniformity. I give these stats not to be negative and not to give a daunting perspective, but rather to emphasize that if there is going to be a change at the leadership level, it's gotta be because we force the issue. We have to force the issue. We have to force it in all of our negotiations. We have to force it in all of our demands. We cannot be satisfied. Ladies, we cannot grow complacent. We need to continue to push, not just for a seat at the table. We need to push to be at the head of that table. So what can women do? Do we leave, lean in, litigate? Faced with a combination of limited advancement, barriers to business development, and sometimes hostile workplaces, many women choose to simply leave the profession. I was actually reminded of a controversy, a well-known Philadelphia litigation firm where that firm allegedly, allegedly terminated a paralegal when she complained about flagrant and persistent sexual harassment at the hands of the shareholders. The behavior of the shareholder involved leaving sexually explicit notes on her desk, commenting about her figure, her clothing, her scent in public in front of other colleagues. The paralegal alleged that another shareholder praised that other individual for doing a quote, good job hiring a hot girl like her. And when she complained, she states that she was told, oh, that's just guy talk. And when she escalated the matter, she was terminated. This is a young woman in her early 20s. She studied pre-law. Maybe she would have become a lawyer. Maybe not anymore. She ran head on into the culture that has forced too many women out of not just law, but of many, many, professional spaces. And let me be clear, this matter has not been fully litigated. And like so many cases, this was resolved outside of the public view. So I'm not naming or saying that there was an accusation there. And I'm not even going to weigh in on the credibility of the accuser. But do any of you guys find these allegations so far out of the ordinary? And I'm talking to ladies and men. Do we doubt? the existence of such a culture? No. And I know we're on Zoom and our videos are off. 
but I guarantee you there's a lot of women out there nodding their heads and understanding and can share similar, if not quite as lurid stories from their own experience. And let me tell you, for context, that firm that I was talking about is 90% male dominated at the shareholder level with only one person of color among the 90%. It's similarly dominated at the department head level. So is there any question that this would be the makeup of a firm in which that type of culture could exist? Where such explicit sexual harassment could be dismissed as guy talk or even locker room banter? Was I put on the Cosby case because I'm a female or because I'm black? What is the real question here? The real question that those people are asking me is for what purpose did a white male see fit to use you? Isn't that the implicit question? Was she a diversity hire? Was she hired because she's black? Because she's a woman? Because she's hot? So long as the leadership of our profession is dominated by a uniformity of race and gender, the implicit question underlying every single decision is why did the white males in the position of power make this decision? And what's the result? Our skills, our talents, and all of our many accomplishments all move to the background. Many people may not remember this, but when Beyonce released her first solo album, and everyone who knows me out there knows, I cannot give a speech or make any type of comment without mentioning my angels or without mentioning Beyonce. But many of you may not remember this, but when Beyonce released her first solo album, the very underwhelmed male music reviewer for the New York Times stated in the headline, quote, the solo Beyonce, she's no Ashanti. You know what? He was right, but not for any of the reasons that he thought. He couldn't see her for what she was. And that didn't stop her. More recently, when Rihanna was set to headline for the Super Bowl, Stephen Smith said, she ain't Beyonce. And he's right. But again, not for any of the reasons that he thought. He couldn't see her for what she was. These men couldn't see these wonderful, beautiful, talented, successful billionaire women for what they were and what they are and what they will be. And that didn't stop Rihanna from showing her beautiful belly bump in another proud announcement of motherhood. These women are absolute forces of nature. And ladies, so are we. As professional women, we are not seen for who we are. We are often boxes to be checked and PR pieces to be published. But you know what? We are also experts in our field. We are harder workers than many of our male peers and the coming majority. We should not apologize for fighting for leadership positions in our firms and demanding the equal compensation and the equal opportunities that should come with them. Barriers do not fall. Trust me, they don't fall. Barriers get knocked down and we knock them down. We knock them down when we give the business opportunity to the peer who has proven themselves consistently without recognition. We knock down these barriers when we get a seat on the compensation committee and make sure that women are being paid dollar for dollar with men. We knock them down when we work with each other, when we support each 
other, when we encourage each other to not rest and not settle for anything less than the heads of our jobs, our organizations, and our companies, and we knock them down when we refuse to tolerate the hostile culture that is often dismissed as guy talk. And when we do that, do you know what will happen? Someday, a young girl will walk through the doors of our organization. And this is whether you work for a nonprofit, whether you work for a small organization, whether you work for a large firm or a Fortune 500 company. When that young woman walks through the door, that woman will see a majority of women in the leadership or board positions. She'll be taken out to lunch by that leadership who will tell her that she reminds her of herself. And she sees a great future in her, a future where the sky is the limit. And that young woman will look at the people in the C-suite, the people in the leadership, the people on the board, the people in equity position, and they will know that that comment is true. That's how we break down barriers. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do I, I can read the questions in the chat. Sorry, I'm just pulling it up. Let's see. Okay. Um, where are we, going? we had one young lady comment. This does happen in all industries. Thank you for saying that. How do you handle, what do you do? How do you see when it is women who say these things, those things ask those questions? I just get sad and angry and frustrated that women don't help other women all the time. I 100% agree. In fact, some of my fr close friends who are in the audience know that I had a very bad experience um, with another black female who was so nasty, not just to myself, but to other black females in the firm. And because we, as other black females, were able to bind together, it at least assisted us in fully understanding that it wasn't us, that it was something more. Um, it is incredibly frustrating, but it taught me something very important. And I would love to hear what anyone else may think about this, but it taught me something really important. And that's that when we look for sponsors and we look for allies and we look for mentors, don't just be limited to people who look like us. Look for sponsors in people who are currently holding those majority positions. I know that um, my firm currently, they are absolutely amazing in every single endeavor that I have, in all of the female initiatives that I look for and I look to fund, they are the first ones saying, yes, Kristen, whatever you need. Those are white male sponsors. They are willing to allow me to advocate for change. In my last firm, um, Bill Sasso, he was absolutely amazing. He was a sponsor. He gave me business so that I could work and I could get exposed to other clients so that I was able to bring in my own business. Again, white males who are sponsors, who are mentors, who assist with getting to the top. Yeah, I'll tell you, at least for me, I want my mentor, I want my sponsor, I want my uh, person who I look up to to be a black female. And yes, I have tons, Marilu Watson, who many of you know, Leola Hardy, who many of you know, so many wonderful black women out there who have grabbed my hand, pulled me to the top. But sometimes you're not gonna find it in people who look like you. The one thing I gotta emphasize, don't stop, don't give up. Don't think that that's the trend of all black women or black people or people of color or women in those leadership positions. 
turn around and keep stepping. Maybe that firm, maybe that company is not the place for you because if they are going to allow a culture like that where those people are supposed to probably welcome and retain diverse members, they're not doing a good job. A lot of times um, people in those positions and maybe understandably think there's only room for one at the top. And guess what? That is not the case. That is not the case. If we wanna keep these barriers up, yeah, go ahead and hold that view, but that's not the case. So I would always recommend don't stop there. Um, and this extends to everyone, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I have horror stories and it's not to fantasize on these horror stories, but it's to illustrate the obstacles so that they can be avoided in the future. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, I'm so thankful to get so much love from all of my friends. I love all of you. Um, and I have another question. What advice would you give to women who may be struggling with persevering through the challenges they face, especially when, they, when they're feeling unsupported or being in a hostile culture? Look, I think one of the easiest things to do is say, leave, leave that firm. But as a proud mother, and proud wife, I got mouths to feed. And so that's not always an option. I think the best advice that I can give to a person, a woman who's struggling with persevering through the challenges they face, reach out to me, reach out to other women that you may trust, someone that you have a comfortable relationship with and talk to that person, talk it out. One thing I always warn people, don't act out in anger. Many people who know me in the county have seen that side of me, unfortunately, and it's not always so pretty. So, and it doesn't always result in the consequences or results that you want. So make sure that you have someone in your corner who can calm you down. That is my husband. My, um, he always calms me down. I currently have uh, my, my, my team here at Salt Mongolese, my Marnie Berger, Amanda Weisbach, Martin Palomo, they calm me down, they get me centered. And I do the same for them. You have to have people in your corner who know you, who you trust, who you can talk to these things about. Perhaps you're um, not the only one experiencing such a hostile culture. And then you don't just have to go alone. You don't. You can feel supported when you go to confront it. Sometimes there are legal issues that are being violated here. And so there are certain protections that need to be um, exercised. So I would always say that if you are struggling with persevering through some of the challenges, and these challenges could extend from a hostile work culture to something that I have experienced, which is not getting, you know, as, a, as an associate in law firm, not getting the greatest opportunities to do the legal research, to do the, to do the legal writing, where you get front face in front of the client, getting the trial opportunities, getting those opportunities to be in front of a client, to pitch certain uh, ideas to leadership. I've been in those positions. It is so much better when you have people in your corner who support you and can really truly be that voice so that you don't feel like you're alone, so that you don't feel like you're wrong, and so that they can help guide you in whatever ideas you have to make a solution um, for that type of hostile, unsupported, or lack of productive environment. The ultimate issue is in order to succeed, you have to be productive. And in those cultures, we just don't thrive. That's just a psychological effect of being in those hostile work type environments. So do what's best for you and get people in your corner. Talk about it. Um, I love the, the love I'm getting here. I really appreciate all of these comments. You guys are truly amazing. Um, Oh, thank you guys so much. I love everything that I'm seeing. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are other questions. I'm not sure if I'm missing anything. Thank you guys so much. And I'm here to answer any questions. Um, that anyone may have.
And while we're waiting for questions, I will say happy Women's History Month to everybody. <laughs> Teresa, I don't believe there are any further questions in the chat. Okay. All right, well, uh, first I wanted to thank you, Kristen, so much for sharing facts and your experience and wisdom with us today. Um, your story of strength and perseverance reminds me of one of my favorite poems. Uh, Just when you thought I would shed my leaves, I blossomed. Um, I love that poem. Um, but you have reminded us today that women continue to deal with society and workplace barriers based on our gender alone uh, and also at intersections. So whether it's race, sexual orientation or disability or other aspects of our identity. Um, and sometimes it is at the hands of other women who have internalized the many patriarchal systems and processes um, as normal, even when they don't benefit us. So thankfully, uh, DEI work has accelerated to the top of the ladder and it's hitting bottom lines and recruitment efforts in a lot of organizations, as you mentioned. So nationwide, women are changing jobs at record rates to work for organizations that support DEI initiatives and offer more remote work possibilities. Um, they also seek to be recognized, rewarded, and compensated for additional work that's typically not recognized or rewarded or that leads to advancement, such as their level of emotional intelligence, supporting their teams, helping to manage their workloads, checking on employee well being, all of which are critical to job satisfaction and retention. For a long time, the weight has been put on women to change in order to assimilate or to make accommodations to old systems. But women represent the powerful forces of change, as you mentioned, and we can all lead in that effort no matter what level you're at. You're never too small to make a difference. In fact, I would say that we have a responsibility to demonstrate and encourage a culture that fosters inclusion, respect for ideas, and diversity of thought. So don't let anyone tell you that you're not smart enough, you're not educated enough, you're not assertive or aggressive enough, you're not peppy enough, you're not light enough, you don't have executive presence, or because you have kids, it's assumed that you aren't dedicated enough, or you're not skinny enough, or you're too old, or your hair is too gray, because you are enough and you were made to lead. Um, one of my other favorite poems is, we all move forward when we recognize how resilient and striking the women are around us. So I thank you again, Kristen, for sharing your experience with us. And we hope to have you back here uh, at another time. But if anyone else has any other questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to try to get them answered um, and sent out via email. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Kristen, for that very motivating and inspiring uh, talk with us. We appreciate you giving us and sharing your time with us today. So thank you. Um, and just imagine that we're giving you a standing ovation and a hearty <laughs> of applause. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>